So today's guest is Gerald Bork. He is the leader of the KISS Party, Keep It Simple Solutions, and he's here today to share his perspectives on New Brunswick, things we could be doing better, and things that he's learned as he's done his research. Welcome, Gerald. Pleased to be here. And away we go. So lead us on, Macduff. Well, um, I'd like to say in the start that uh, I uh, am here to uh, show how the both the uh, progressive conservatives and the liberal parties have gotten so um, misleading that they they're not in control anymore. No matter who's just lead it, the backroom boys are controlling it, and uh, it's not working. And something's got to change, or New Brunswick's going to be in very serious trouble. And, uh, so, from your perspective, the uh the pattern we've had for 30 or 40 years of it doesn't matter who's in government, um, there's going to be someone else or some other entity that's applying pressure to get what they want. And somehow yes. that's not serving the greater good. No, I mean, look at it. I mean, we, we uh, are going deeper and deeper in debt, every government that we put in. And uh, the things that are going on is beyond reason. And uh, it's all coming to a head. It's got to, it's got to change or or we're going into receivership, and it's really going to have some hard times here. Hmm. And that. We'll wander a bit more in your direction, but let's make a mental note that at some point we'll slide back to government debt and maybe the idea of uh, Bank of New Brunswick, which will slide in at the last half of the show. Yep, no problem. Okay, so you're framing up a problem then for New Brunswick, and that it's our continual fiscal challenges, it's our continual political leveraging, for the sake of certain outcomes, and then that not serving the greater good. Yes, I. Uh, it all started when I, uh, missed, when I went to run as a politician, and Mr. Higgs was saying that we had to do um, fracking and shale gas, and uh, I uh, thought, well, okay, uh, let's see what, how much money we're losing by not fracking, hmm. and I wrote to Mr. Higgs and he just refused to uh, reply to me mm -hmm. and that. So that um, uh, led me to see if I could find out. And it's very difficult to get in the, the proper information from the government. They, the, the system is set up so that uh, mm -hmm. they can give you information, but they don't give you enough to, to really conclude on anything. So were you able to go other places to find what you're looking for? No, I, I ended up uh, going to the uh, library at the legislature and uh, got a whole lot of information. And they informed me that I was the only politician that ever went to the library looking for stuff. And when I explained to them I was looking for the information on the shale gas, uh, and I couldn't seem to find it, uh, the head librarian said, well, I think I can get that for you. So I got it. But what she did is she sent me uh, from 2002 to 2017 uh, all the royalties, not just the shale gas, but all the royalties on all the products that are, are done. And uh, just in a five minutes of going over that, I discovered that uh, during 2000 14 to 2000, no, yeah, 2000, well, when Higgs was in with Allward, 10 to 14, yep. that they, uh, was no royalties recorded for uh, timber. And timber is the amount that makes the most for the government, our forest. Mm -hmm. And the royalties on the gas was very small uh, compared to uh, the timber royalties. They were like 500,000, and we're, we're talking uh, uh, 77 million for um, the timber royalties. So according to your research, you couldn't find or that wasn't recorded for a four-year window during the Allward government's um, time in government. Yes. Was there anything for when um, Mr. Allward um, lost to the Liberals in Sean Graham's government, or did the records stop? No. The minute uh, uh, Sean Graham took over, the royalties were recorded. And this is all recorded in natural resources. And so uh, what I did is I, I uh, wrote a letter to Mr. Higgs and said that I, there must be some mistake or 
some simple explanation as to why there was no royalties recorded during that four-year period as he was finance minister. And um, he uh, didn't respond to me. I waited a month. I sent a registered letter. Uh, still no response. And uh, several weeks later, I called the office to find out if they received this information. And uh, when I took it to the uh, premier's office, they stop you on the ground floor with security. You have to give it to them, and they have to pass it on. So uh, uh, I got a recording when I called and told them what I was looking for, mm -hmm. and I never got nothing. So then I turned around two days later and called again, and a lady answered. And she said, oh, you want an answer? I said, yes, I would like one. So then he writes me back a letter talking about shale gas, that he's trying to get a good price for shale gas. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, was the, the main topic. What I was after was about the royalties that weren't recorded. Yeah. So it's possible they were still um, gathered or still paid, but just not recorded. Yes. Is that possible? Because, the, you know, the general audience will be listening to this thinking, well, <clears throat> two themes pop up right away. One, does government have a spending problem or does government have a revenue problem? Yep. So that partly addresses the revenue issue. And the second thing is they'd have Auditor General Kim McPherson in the back of their head talking about government practices and, and <clears throat> recording efficiencies and then needing to be um, more accurate with their revenue streams and their expenditure patterns. Yes. I mean, it's going on right now with the uh, cannabis NB. You know, there. That's right. So somewhere in there, it's not that the money's not there. It's just not being handled properly. Yes. Well, and there's no transparency. You you can't get past the the obstacles. You have d d difficulty uh, getting it. Um, what I did is I sent in five uh, right to information acts. Okay. And uh, uh, I got. Uh, slow responses but i did get responses so that's a positive thing yeah. and it, for just to interrupt for a second on, on no that problem. slow responses um mm -hmm. having interviewed anne bertrand when she was the right to information <laughs> and, uh, commissioner um, she explained what her workload was like <laughs> and the number of requests they get and how long it takes when she forwards it as a valid request mm -hmm. to then the civil service has to kind of gather up the information um so uh, just to cut some slack part of that yeah. office, no, they no. work because it's a good point though, because it'll it'll map out the challenges in the system where yes. a citizen and a leader of a political party is doing some homework, and then it's gonna take a while to get through because the people that would help facilitate that are a little bit under resourced. Yes, but you did eventually get. Yes, I I, I did eventually get some information, and the more information I got, the worse the picture looked. <laughs> I uh, I got the reports back. Uh, I guess the first thing I did is I went to Natural Resources mm -hmm. and uh, asked why there was no recorded royalties for timbers. Mm -hmm. And they've been recorded in Natural Resources from 2002 to 2011, I believe it was. And then uh, it was recorded afterwards in Natural Resources with the Sean Grain government. Mm -hmm. So... They said, oh, it's been shifted to a different department under a different name. And they sent me to Energy Mines and Resources. So I went to Energy Mines and Resources and asked them for those four years of, of uh, records. And, and uh, I received them. And when I looked at them, there was no uh, royalties mentioned in it. So I went back and I said, well, I was looking for the timber royalties. Oh, that's recorded in a different place. And anyway, they turned around and they took the natural resources reports that they gave me and they just added them onto the bottom and gave it back to me. And uh, what I did was... Uh, so you did get the timber royalty numbers then? Yes, I okay. did. But they're they're under uh, energy mines and resources, not under natural resources. Okay. Why he shifted them, it, it's hard to say. Okay. And what I put out on the internet was that I felt that because these royalties was not recorded, that's where these tariffs for timber got 
placed on the province of New Brunswick. And um, okay. so, in your estimation, from looking at that, then, and if you could give us a concrete example or a for instance that might help audience um, follow. Yeah. Um, so do we? You started by talking about getting fair value, maybe, or uh, the revenue stream mm -hmm. from this. So when you finally got the numbers, what did you feel about them? Well, the numbers were uh, good. I mean, like I say, it was up to $77 million a year for, for royalties on timber mm -hmm. and that. And um, But then I got an email from a person, and uh, they told us that, or they told me that that's not the reason that the we got declined. It, it, the reason we got declined is that the United States government found out that the government uh, was subsidizing and that the woods industry got uh, 20, I think it was 27 um, uh, subs different subsidies for doing their operation. And this is why the... Uh, why the states imposed the tariffs they did. That would be the softwood lumber tariffs about yes. two years ago? Yep. Seems to me or Irving Industries or JDI managed to get an exemption from it and that Nova Scotia was exempt from it, but New Brunswick overall wasn't. Does this tie to what your research showed? Yes, it, 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 well, it makes me wonder why New Brunswick didn't get the exemption we got it the, other, the rest of the time. Uh, I believe PEI is exempt and Newfoundland's exempt also. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it, it's really, uh, when I wrote back to this person and they sent me a copy of all the, the subsidy programs, and I took that to the library, and I was they was able to confirm that these programs did exist, mm -hmm. and some were expired, but I got the information on them all. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't get into details yet as to how much money they got for each one of them, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, it would take a, a, a lot of research to do that and, and that, but it's, it's, it can be done. General question away from the specifics, but just your, your perspective. Um, one of the themes that continues to play out, because um, you started by ta asking about change. So we, we got to start changing how we're doing things. Yes. One of those narratives that is constant in New Brunswick is that government has to subsidize business in order for business to stay alive. That's it, So when talking about subsidies, um, I wonder if you have some thoughts about uh, that shift. Like how do we just let business make it on their own? And... And can government then have enough money to get itself out of debt because they're so interrelated? Yes. I believe that if they didn't subsidize these businesses, uh, they, you know, they would survive. Uh, up in uh, other provinces, they're, you know, they stop spraying and it, it's, the industry's doing fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, here... We end up, uh, the government's ending up paying out to to NB Power and to Irvin to spray this province, mm -hmm. and uh, they're spending over uh, three million dollars, mm -hmm. and every year. And and uh, you know the the sad thing about it is it's just spraying that is hurting our health, hurting our waterways. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a need to kind of complete the circle in the thinking. That, yes. Uh, here's the task, and you got the task done, but there's a consequence over here. Yes. Um, we could apply that principle to several different sectors and areas. Yes. But back to the general theme of, of government and its role um, in community. So more or less, the government's role is to protect and empower people in yes. general terms. But over the past 30 or 40 years, um, it's really evolved that government's there to support industry and support business. Yeah. That seems to be the top priority. Uh, Mr. Higgs, when, when you know, talking to the Fortune 500 Club and in Wall Street and on Bay Street and um, doing all of that stuff a premier is supposed to do, um, it really dominates the headlines. But meanwhile, back home, there's the challenge with... Um, workers in senior care facilities and there's the challenge with having more people um, stay at home because there's more home care workers mm -hmm. so those are all tough priorities and everything is important but a shift does need to occur at some point 
with um, who has what role and what's the most effective place to shift the system so that we have the changes we're looking for. Yes. Can you play in that space a little bit? Because you're doing all this research work on, on how we are doing what we're doing. Right. So how do you see shifting it a bit so that it's better for everyone overall? Well, I, I really feel that if uh, we didn't subsidize industry so big and uh, they, can, they can survive on their own, they're doing it in other provinces, they're not getting the subsidies that New Brunswick is passing out. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, look at the call centers. I mean, uh, they, they subsidize them and uh, as soon as the money's gone, they just pull out and go again. And uh, a program that would be a lot better than that is, uh, this would be one shift, is that if you took and helped small businesses get going, mm -hmm. and instead of putting that money into call centers, you put it into a, an organized team that is accountant, that helps you set up your computer so that your computer program is set up right. Uh, then you have marketing people and you have uh, engineers that, that look at the product the person's designing and maybe design changes. And then uh, uh, a team that maybe would do studies to uh, see which would be the best market to move into and all that. There's an awful lot of smart people in this province, but they're, they're individuals and they have good ideas, but they just need a rounded out formula to make things work better. and. Uh, this here service could be provided, I believe, to those people. And as soon as, like, you set up your computer and get the count and go, and then you just step back and let him go on at his own. And if he needs help, he calls you back and say, well, look, I'm changing. I'd, I'd like to add this to it or whatever. And, and they help get it all set up. And it'll make it so that the payrolls are all good and it's easy for them. And and uh, it, it's, it's, you know, this is what needs to be done to help small businesses and then small business would function a lot better. So a collaborative business approach that's spearheaded mm. by the government. A little bit, it reminds me a touch of the old uh, enterprise system that was set up. There was an enterprise system set up in Bathurst and in Fredericton and St. John and Moncton. And they s seemed to run their course or morphed into other things after 10 or 12 or 15 years or yeah. so. Um, it also fits two other conversations that I've had here on the show. Right. Um, one is the permaculture world where um, a local economy, by understanding what they have available in their economy, you know, within a small area, like a 50-mile yep. radius. What do we do really well here? What resources do we have naturally here? Um, what are we missing? And one of the things that consistently comes up is a bit of professional help in a certain key areas, because my strength is my woodlot management. Yep. My strength is managing my 50-acre farm. Yeah. My strength is not um, developing a database so I can manage my inventory differently. Right. You know, those sorts of things. So it seems to hit that note. And the other one was an interview with Carl Duvenvorden and Peter Corbin on impact of climate change specific to New Brunswick. <clears throat> and Carl, in his closing comments, more or less said that as he's traveled around the province, he's learned that there's an awful lot of what he calls backyard engineers or backyard geniuses or backroom geniuses yep. that are forever tinkering and playing and adapting, which is the very thing you need. And he said, and we should be kind of capturing that, but they're good at the tinkering. They're good at the creating. They're not good at getting down to Boston or New York or that's, to, to sell what they've got. They need someone to help bridge that. And that's exactly what I mean by that group. Of, uh, of people take the money from the, the call centers that they, they put into it and put into this group and help. And every person has a different need, but as it changes, then we can, you know, inject people into it to, to assist them in getting it going. And I'm sure that there would be a lot of business that would really boom in this province if, if they had that assistance. Yeah, there is one um, theory to business development or uh, economic development uh, that we don't hear much of here, which is that the local community knows its own solutions. They just need to be given <laughs> the authority to go ahead and get on with them, to create their own like little network for what they know how to do well. Um, another interview was Carlos Gomez four or five years ago. And um, while most of that interview was talking about drum making and spiritual journey, yep. the first 20 minutes was when 
Carlos worked in the Pierre Trudeau government. He worked in northern New Brunswick implementing a guaranteed annual income strategy under Finance Minister Pierre Lalonde at the time. And of course it was really successful. And one of the key pieces was they let the community make the decisions for the community. Mm -hmm. They let them have the autonomy, just gave them the resources. Yeah. And, and that's the same as, as tourism is, is being overlooked here tremendously. I mean, uh, uh, I was up, uh, I sold real estate and, and had a lot of, I sold it mainly to people overseas on the web. And I've had a lot of people come and two years ago I had uh, people here from Holland and they come and visited and then we went up to uh, uh, Heartland, the longest covered bridge in the world. Yeah. And uh, now they closed that tourism information center there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, tourism, when money comes in from tourism, it's not out of our taxpayers' dollars. It's mm -hmm. from visitors, and that, that's a big boost to the economy. And, yeah. and there's so much that New Brunswick has I traveled all over, I worked in the Arctic and I traveled all over Canada. And when I come back to New Brunswick, I realized how beautiful it really is. And I think the problem is, is that the people that are bought up here and live here all their life and never really get out and experienced it, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, they just don't understand it. Uh, they just take things for granted and think it's that way everywhere. Well, it isn't. Yeah. We, we have a lot of, you know, beautiful rivers, a lot of beautiful countryside and stuff, and it's not being uh, promoted properly, in my mind. So here's a conundrum for you mm -hmm. to play with on tourism. Um, in 2015, uh, my wife and I are down in Funday National Park, yep. um, having a great time walking the trails for three or four days. One of those trail walks, we run into a couple um, who are in their 60s, with thick German accents. So where are you guys from? So we're from New York what are you doing here like how did you find it here we like it here because no one else knows it's here <laughs> next day we're having um some of those famous cinnamon buns and some tea and stuff at a coffee shop down in alma a uh, young couple from vermont in their 30s they've got all the hiking kit and everything so i asked them so why are you here we love it here because no one knows it's here <laughs> so it teaches me that maybe as we do develop tourism, maybe there's a way to put a, a maximum on it or, or some sort of a governor that, because if that's a theme, it would make a great ad commercial, you know? Yeah. Come visit New Brunswick, the best place that you never knew was there. Or yes. The nicest place you never saw, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, which, of course, would draw the opposite and it would be overrun with, with people. Well, but, but that challenge with tourism, there, there's so much more we could be doing without running any risk of exploiting the, nature's resources too much. Yes, I really believe it. And, and there's so many different locations like the Canadian Peninsula and, and uh, uh, Campbellton area is, is uh, you know, there, there's just so many beautiful spots. Yeah. And up the St. John River Valley and, and uh, you know, uh, down I was down to St. Andrews last week and it was always one of my favorite spots, and yeah. Grand Manan Island and Campobello Island, and th there's just so many different places that I don't yeah. think we would ever get to the point where, well, we, I won't say we would never get to the point, but we'd have an awful lot more tourism going yeah. on than yeah. what we got now. So in that spirit, what do you think about tolls on the highway? Well, the on the tolls on the highway, I feel they should be tolls all put on the main entry points into the province. Uh, our, our highways uh, have to be maintained, and uh, tolls would be coming in would be for the would be dollars that are not taxpayers' dollars here from the province. Mm -hmm. And uh, we discussed this in our party, and and uh, I said, well, we'll let all New Brunswickers drive free. Well, they said you can't do that, and the reason is is that if you give the gatekeeper the power to take and uh, allow cars through without paying tolls, uh, what happens would be that, okay, a car pulls up from Ontario or wherever, anywhere, and uh, they charge 350 for the car, and the guy says, want a receipt? And he says, nope, and he lets him go and puts the money in his pocket. So to keep it honest, you have to have a camera system, you have to have a, a, Easy pass. a system. So 
what we do with New Brunswickers, instead of everybody going getting an easy pass, we would take and, and uh, give people's receipt and they can file it on their income tax the next year. And that way they would get the amount of money back that they paid. Now, for small businesses and trucks and that, we would arrange the easy pass so that they haven't got to uh, wait till the end of the year to get their money back because mm -hmm. they travel every day type thing and that. And I really feel that money should be going to back settlements and and roads to be fixed up because uh, I live in Woodland and it's been there since 72 and and there's no, uh, there's not been, uh, well, we got seven tenths of a kilometer chip sealed mm -hmm. and you know, and it's, uh, they're in bad shape and, but the government just don't see it as a priority. and That gets tangled back into the amount of debt the government carries. Yes. It gets into limited resources for spreading the money around and where are the priorities. And that too is will be another shift one day. Mm -hmm. um, infrastructure, whether it's human infrastructure like education, healthcare, or whether it's physical infrastructure like road maintenance. Yeah. But it seems like... Um, it's all these competing priorities rather than a shared vision. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, and it, it, it's uh, the, one of the biggest things, and, and Mr. Higgs uh, uh, did it, wrote a letter when he was uh, uh, running for leadership. And uh, uh, when I decided to go, I decided that I would go to another party, and I went to every party leader. To discuss it with them, and uh, it was devastating, <laughs> depressing. I guess would be the word. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, he sent me a 32-page letter, and it stated that the reason the Brunswick's not getting ahead is that when they're in government, they are are um, you know challenged by the opposition because their opposition, they just oppose everything the government does. Mm -hmm. And when it changes, the same thing happens. And uh, so I would like to get rid of the word opposition out of the legislature completely mm -hmm. and call them the party of sober second thought. And that way the government puts out <coughs> their plans and what happens is the, uh, the other uh, elected members, because let's face it, when you elect someone to run in your riding, the people believe that person is the best and would do the best for them in that riding, mm -hmm. and and that's fine. And uh, so once they're in there, even though they may be not in power, they still have a lot of good ideas. And the only way we're going to solve these problems is that everybody starts working together, and uh, give credit due when some of the opposition comes up with credit, mm -hmm. with a good idea. Uh, let them the public know that that was their idea and and that and everybody worked together and and we can solve these problems yep there are some who will say we need electoral reform in order to solve the problems it may be that we just need a change of heart that the system is fine if we would let go of how we've always manipulated or managed or uh, participated in the system like you described that yeah if you're in opposition and they're going to oppose everything you do yes um several conversations recently with civil servants um, and listening to frustrations and not, not on the show, just in passing, you know, listening to healthy frustrations with, you know, oh, we've had a change in government, so everything has to now change direction. Um, if you talk to anyone in the voluntary sector, they'll talk about streamlining all their programming to fit the criteria for this particular government. And then the third or fourth year, they finally get, you know, the programs in place and then poof, there's a change in government. Oh, we have to stop doing that now. So literacy programs, healthcare delivery programs, yep. recreational programs, take your pick. It all has to kind of stop, take a pause, wait, what the new government decides what it wants to do. You, you can't do that. It's a 20 to 25 year window to affect change in some key areas, it's not a four year cycle. The new legislature has done something, and New Brunswick voters have done something that hasn't happened in 100 years, which is the four-way minority government. Right. Thoughts on that? Because it comes close to what you talk about of uh, they need to all figure out how to get together and do it. The media keep portraying it as an us and them thing. Yeah. They, they just failed to report it as it's just us. Yeah. What, what I'd like to say is that uh, both the liberals and conservatives, when they get in, 
their focus after they get in elected is to get in again. Hmm. And they make all decisions based on, oh, how many votes is that going to get us? Hmm. And not on what is best for New Brunswick. Hmm. And that's what's got to change, the attitude. And if we just get away from those two old parties and get uh, uh, the new groups in there, the new parties in there, and they start working together to solve these problems, they're, they're, it's amazing what you can do. Now, speaking about volunteers, uh, I would like to say that uh, I went up and, and when I was started farming in the 72, and uh, I ended up, there was an accident next door, and we I went and took the tractor over and lifted the, uh, the tractor off of a guy that rolled it over on himself, and, and uh, we didn't have an ambulance service up there. So anyway, we went after the government to get an ambulance service, a group of us, not just me, but a group of us. And uh, we got this volunteer ambulance service started, and it took a while, but uh, I ended up being an instructor, and uh, I worked on it for 25 years. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it was amazing what can be accomplished. And it was only several years later that I discovered that this ambulance service was the first volunteer ambulance service in the province of New Brunswick. And from that model, it grew to 100 before they made it a paid system hmm. and that. And then uh, a few years after that, I started New Brunswick Ground Search and Rescue. And before I started New Brunswick Ground Search and Rescue, or I was one of the founding members, I shouldn't say I started it all by myself, but uh, the RCMP had a, a lost boy in the middle of winter. He was out trapping, and he, he never come back in a snowstorm. And uh, so I conducted two searches for the RCMP, the search coordinator, before they even had the first ground search and rescue meeting. And when I went to the first meeting, they uh, enjoined, they made me search coordinator, and I was search coordinator for 18 years. But I went on beyond that, and I helped start all other 13 teams and they're, they're, the ground search and rescue is a very uh, dedicated organization. This is a pin right here, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of it. And that, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's down to 12 teams now in the province to cover the whole province, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's a real good organization, and, and they work for floods and fires and, and any kind of, uh, whenever they need uh, uh, evidence searches for RCMP and, and all that. Hmm. And then a few years after that, I started critical incident stress debriefing. Uh, when I was on the ambulance service, I put in for it for seven years in a row. And they called me up and they said, oh, you're going to be on the team. And I said, well, no, I'm too busy. I got a farm and I'm looking after this and that. I had six full-time employees or mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, no, you're the reason. You put in for it for seven years in a row and... Uh, you're going to be on it. So I did go, and, and I was on it for 14 years. And uh, now uh, every police force has a, a debriefing team, uh, uh, RCMP. Uh, uh, the schools all have, uh, they don't call them debriefing. They, they call them uh, uh, counselors. Counselors, yeah. And thank you. And uh, But uh, we debriefed uh, RCMP, firemen. Firemen all got uh, teams. Uh, I've uh, been to banks uh, where a sudden death occurred in the bank and debriefed them, and uh, I've debriefed them where they had robbery. Uh, it, uh, and, and it, it works great, and it was all volunteer. And uh, so it, it's, uh, it's amazing what a few people, when they decide that they're going to do something and, and people work together, they can really accomplish a lot. And uh, that's what I see about this year, uh, forming a new party. The other parties are all set up on the same system as the old ones, and it's not working good. And one big change that I see, or, or I think it's a big change in my mind, is that to pick candidates, uh, we uh, interview them instead of having nominations. Because where would you go for a job as a nomination? Your boss never goes and says, okay, I want to hire another man. You guys, uh, you know, go find a guy you like the best and, and bring him to me. It just don't happen that way. 
you know, and uh, uh, that's one thing I think you really should change is that, uh, uh, you know, get rid of the nominations and because it's a popularity contest. It doesn't mean that the person's best qualified for the job. So because you pay close attention to it um, and because the legislature is sort of an unusual creature this time around, um, can you uh, offer your thoughts on on how the dynamic is playing out between uh, the four parties that did get in there? Um, and maybe a little bit what media do to it, because you suffer from lack of media coverage. Oh, because, definitely. you know, your party's <laughs> not taken seriously, even though you are an official choice. Same thing happens with uh, how the media treat independent candidates. Yes. Um, there were the first glimmerings this election um, that I saw of um, the idea that the legislature doesn't have to be made up of political parties. You could actually have 49 independent candidates and they could run a bit like a municipal council. And their job is just to work together to make the best solutions for the, the best solutions for the province. So that's not that's not a wacky idea because we're we're not umpteen millions of people. They do it in the Yukon. Hmm. They they elect uh, there's no parties. They just elect a candidate to to serve their area, hmm. and then those candidates get together and pick the leader. And, uh, and then they go from but, there. And, and then whatever cohesion or decisions they make, that'll show their strengths or yeah. their weaknesses. But they yeah. have a responsibility to make that work. We're, we're like an intermediary step from that with having four parties in the legislature. Yeah. We still continue to fail to include First Nations in the conversation from the get-go, not as an afterthought, and we're going to do a consultation, but in the design work right from the beginning. So that's, that's pretty close to having a version of representation based on not red and blue and purple and orange and green and you know but on ideas and, yes and you can reconfigure that house based on that idea and then it comes closer to you your comment about um, being accountable back to people and we need to do it a different way from watching it the past month are we closer to that from where we were a year ago or is it still divided on, you know, green and red are going this way and purple and blue are going that way? Because that's how the media tell us it is. Yes, and that's that's what unfortunately happened. Uh, I, I really uh, am, am a bit disappointed. I was really had high hopes for, uh, you know, uh, all the parties that get in and uh, thought, no, you know, we're going to see a, a significant change. And uh, here are the purple uh, People's Alliance. They uh, campaigned on, uh, you know, uh, for different things. But then when they get in, and now they're flip-flopping, and they're, they're going with the conservatives on everything, even though they didn't, uh, they didn't campaign on that. They, they were, like, against uh, spraying. And they turned around and supported the government, and yet they're spraying and they have a chance a great power chance to to sort of just say well if you don't uh, mm -hmm. if you don't don't stop spraying we're going to do yep. it but the logical consequence of not supporting the government would then be a another no election. confidence vote and then another election and so how do you dance in that space? Because people, for the most part, and there's another piece of our conversation we haven't touched on yet as we slide into politics, is the voter. A lot of times all the attention's spent on the political parties, and the media yep. will draw that attention. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, yeah, but 40% of the people didn't participate, roughly, so they didn't vote. And 60% of the people created this new dynamic, um, but it's still got elements of um, us and them to it. Yes. If that makes sense? Yes, it does. And that, that's one thing about that if we get rid of the opposition and then, uh, you know, get the idea into people's heads that, oh, we're all the government and we all got to work together. And that's exactly the best way to mold it. Now, speaking of the Yukon, I've been trying to find uh, articles saying that it's good, bad or otherwise. Hmm. And uh, it's not... Uh, you know, I haven't seen where it's, oh, this is a lot better system. Yeah. It, it's just uh, not uh, spoken much of. And as far as um, proportional representation goes, I don't think that's all that bad. Uh, but again, it's if the people come in and they are considered, uh, you know, 
to, to work with the government. Now, Mr. Higgs, uh, I was at his throne speech, and he stated 21 times in 10 pages that he was going to work across party lines. Mm -hmm. And the only way he'll work across party lines if the party does what he wants them to do. If they don't, he won't talk to them. And that's not so th proper. Is so that's kind of leveraging the risk of another election too soon after the current one. So you can hold that over the other th three parties mm. to say, well, fine, you go ahead and vote us out, and then you're the one that'll be the cause for the next election, and people don't want one. Um, I've, things come, so many things come to mind. One, where did this notion that people don't want another election come from? I mean, I'll read it in the media, but they don't cite their sources where, where they got it from. You know, so there's a mystery in our narrative about well, why wouldn't want why wouldn't people want another election, and and what if it goes another way? What if it's like, um, ten, ten, and ten sort of thing? Yes, <laughs> you know, it's always the media always frame it as a foregone conclusion. It's mainly two parties, and the other ones are irrelevant, yeah. even though now we're like months into it, and yeah. the the six kind of freewheeling seats are are even more relevant than before. Oh yes, and and. I think all all the seats should be very relative in the government, and mm -hmm. it's it's. But the leadership is is got to change its attitude, and that's where the conservatives and liberals will not change their attitude. They is it possible that there's co collaboration going on behind the scenes, and we just are not told those stories? I don't believe so because I've I've been talking to uh, uh, David Kuhn, and uh, you know I said well you know. I, I was wondering how things are going along. I said in the throne speech, and in that throne speech, uh, Mr. Higgs signed it and gave it to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, he said he'll only talk to us if we agree with what he wants. And uh, so uh, it, it's not uh, there's not a, a lot of collaboration going on behind. No much give and take. And uh, even with the People's Alliance, I, I'm really I, I think there's a bit more with the Conservatives and them there, but. Uh, it's really amazing that, uh, to me, or, or in disbelief that, uh, you know, they, they can flip-flop. I, I can't see, if you don't believe in spraying, why you would spray. And uh, Jeff Carr signed the papers, and he said, oh, well, the, 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 the government and the forestry uh, haven't got their, you know, finances in place to, to do it another way. Mm -hmm. Well... I'll tell you something. I'm, a, I'm an intervener at NB Power, and if they were told they couldn't spray, it's not going to ruin NB Power for one year till they get organized and, and start putting workers out there cutting bushes instead of spraying. Mm -hmm. And the woods industry is the very same. It's not if they stop spraying, it doesn't mean that the you know the force is going to collapse and it's all going to go to pieces. Mm -hmm. This here is saying that you know, and until they are forced to do this the industry's not going to do it because it's they can they can do it cheaper that way but what you know our health problem is a is a great big concern mm -hmm. and all this spray is just adding to it i believe mm -hmm. i mean uh, different topic but same general theme yep. about provincial economy and, and opportunities for doing things better um and you mentioned that you were have had a farm or were a farmer yeah dairy farmer yeah, yeah. um Several guests have been on the show talking about farming. Um, do you have any thoughts how uh, New Brunswick's farming world can actually start contributing in a more effective way to New Brunswick's economy? The economy, once upon a time, was built on the three Fs, forestry, fishing, and farming. Yep. All kinds of attention still on forestry yep. and fishing. The farming element in the past 50, 60 years, it just faded in, into Never Never Land. In terms of the yes. provincial narrative, it's a constant co topic during any election. It's a constant topic in any coffee shop. It's just not there. Other than the farmers are getting older and, yep. and there's nobody taking them and all the family farms are, have dropped. And yet food security is one of the biggest issues worldwide. Yes. So here's a province that used to have 14 or 1,500 farmers and farms down to 300 or 400 yep. now. Yep. Um, we import 92% of our food, and yet we're not showing any concern for food security. Yes. Uh, two things that I could see that would really uh, help improve this a lot, I believe, is is uh, the first one I would say is uh, growing hemp seed. Uh, hemp seed oil is a very healthy product 
Uh, I take it every day, uh, and it's uh, even hard to get because the, the, the number of people that are starting to use it to improve their health is, is astronomical. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we're, we've, uh, I got a couple of people and the government put out four plots uh, a couple of years ago to see if we could grow it here, and it wasn't bad at all. Good, pretty good results. And I would say we should approach an uh, uh, outfit like McCain's. We have to have a $30 million manufacturing process to process the hemp. Okay, good. And that way, uh, McCain also stated that if they grew hemp on the ground, they feel they could uh, reduce their rotation time on potatoes. So it would increase the potatoes. But this hemp seed is very valuable stuff. There's a, a gentleman down in Nova Scotia that I heard, I'd never seen the literature on it, but he grew uh, 68 acres and he got $260,000 for the seed in Brazil. And But then the byproduct of the hemp plant afterwards uh, there's there's a hundred different things you can make of it, and out in uh, Winnipeg they have the hemp plant, and that's where hemp soy seed oil that I'm getting is from, and they also build building blocks for building houses with the R value in the walls R40, and they're equivalent to uh, a thousand degrees for an hour before they'll catch fire. So this is the type of thing that they should be putting up in places like Fort McMurray and in cities where houses are extremely close together mm -hmm. and that. So uh, that would give an extra income to the potato farmers. And here in New Brunswick, if we could get McCain's into the plant, then this could also help PEI. They could, uh, that seed is very small and track of tractor trailer loads over. And if they built a, a manufacturing plant for the fiber, uh, then the same thing. Uh, they could ship it here and even probably would come from the states in Maine because it would increase the, you know, the, the use there. So I believe there would be a good industry for that. Um, in the dairy industry, that's what I was into, there was 550 <coughs> uh, dairy farmers at the time and uh, it's sort of been going nowhere in the sense of, of, of growing. It's shrinking actually. And one reason is the big quotas. It costs a fortune to get a quota and, and get into uh, into farming nowadays. And uh, so the, what I can see is years ago, there's uh, UHT plants that they take in pasteurized milk in such a way that it hasn't got to be refrigerated. And uh, you could set it in this room for a year or out in your yard for a year and then open it and use it and it would not change its taste or its quality. And it's done in canned milk. You know, canned milk's on the shelf, it's not refrigerated and that. Mm -hmm. But look at the cost it would save uh, the stores, the trucks to keep it refrigerated and that. Now the plant's fairly expensive, but if they put one up in Sussex area, we'll say that seems to be where the manufacturing is of, of milk now. So we put up a, a UHT plant there, and then we could have the farm from PEI bring their milk over, uh, dump the milk, sterilize the truck, pump the UHT sterilized milk back into their truck and take it back, and then they could just package it in PEI and the same in Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. maybe the same in Quebec, and that. But uh, I believe it would really increase sales because uh, what would happen is that when cruise ships come in, they would want to buy a tractor trailer load of this because they don't have to put it in a refrigerated unit on the boat. They can just store it, they just refrigerate it before they use it. The Army uh, could, could uh, you know, ship it all over to all their places and that. And uh, the airlines are the same way, the, you know, it, it's uh, <laughs> same thing with food banks. Yeah. And I think that the the industrial milk would fade away and there would be because they could store it for so long and you don't have to store it in refrigeration 
hmm. and all the trucks on the highway and that it, it it would be an environmental saving because they all they all got this gas in them that if they have a leak that's you know gets off into the environment yep. and uh, here uh, wasn't it Trudeau they just gave a whole bunch of money to what plant uh, was it? <laughs> it was what, Galen Weston's family, so it was Loblaws. Loblaws, yeah, for refrigeration units and that. And you see, that wouldn't be needed for milk yeah. and that. So they might want to keep one cooler where you got cold milk for, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and even small stores might do that. But it would reduce the amount, uh, and, and they could buy it. Then, you see, you could make the delivery if the store had space. They could make the deliveries every other day or every three days or whatever, and uh, it wouldn't have to worry about it because it's not not holding up a refrigerator. Yeah, it's not a perishable. Well, in the spirit of, of creative, innovative thinking and systems changes, um, and we're getting close to the end, but we still have a bit of time, uh, let's loop back to the public bank in New Brunswick concept um, for a way of getting a provincial government out of debt. Do you have any thoughts on that? Because it kind of is getting a bit of attention now. People are so used to banking, supposed to be a certain way, they've forgotten that actually banking was another way a hundred years ago, where we banked with ourselves rather than we outsourced it. Yes, and, and it, it's a shame that it happened the way it did, but uh, mistakes are made in, in everything, and, and it's time to correct it. Um, back in 34, I believe it was, they started the uh, Bank of Canada and they actually loan money out to governments and uh, uh, for projects at very low interest rate or no interest rate. And uh, they did that until 1974. And at that point, the government said, well, uh, Canada is in good shape and, and uh, now you have to loan money from the banks and pay interest on it. And, you know, the cartel, really. Uh, the first couple of years, they didn't charge a lot of interest, but then after they got their toehold, they, <laughs> they seemed up it a lot. And since then, we have paid uh, $1.3 billion interest alone, which if we had that money, I don't think New Brunswick or Canada would have a debt. And, uh, and um, the inflation rate, the, this is what I've written to... Uh, Trudeau and to Monroe about it, and uh, but the interest rate uh, they said would uh, you know inflation would come in and, and make it worse. Well, uh, going back over the history from '34 to '74 when it was changed, uh, it was lower then than it has been since. And you must remember back in the '30s, it was right after the war, and all the people were coming back, and they built the St. Lawrence Seaway. They built uh, the Trans-Canada Highway and the railway system, and uh, I've traveled it and and stood in the Mount Rocky Mountains and looked at it and figured, how the heck did they ever do that, you know, way back then and uh, without even the equipment we have today and all this and that. And uh, it, it's, it's just amazing. And again, it's just people getting together and, and doing it. And uh, so, yeah, I, I really think, uh, but the only way I can see the Bank uh, of Canada getting opened up again is that if you turn around and you get all the premiers of the provinces online and all go together to the Prime Minister and demand it, then I think it'll happen. And Iceland just did it. They went a little further than I think needs to be. They threw all their bankers in jail. and. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, the way it is. Any final thoughts as we close out? Um, <laughs> lots of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you got two minutes, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess what I'd like to say is is, is that I am uh, uh, seventy two years old. Uh, I'm retired. I only work eighty eight hours a week. I got a little sawmill, but. <laughs> I really feel this is another need, the same as I've seen the need for the ambulance or for search and rescue or for the uh, critical incident stress debriefing. And I really feel there is people there that are now realizing that what has gone on in, in politics is not good and the system's got to change. 
<coughs> I really feel that I can contribute a lot to it, and that you know, it, it's if we don't get this change, it's going to be really hard for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you like the work we do, go to the dentistreport.ca and support the show. Be good. Have fun. Love each other.